Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the invitation and for this uh, kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here among uh, colleagues, dear friends, um, and students who are joining us this afternoon as well. I'm a little bit uh, overwhelmed because here we are in the middle of a pandemic and I see screens, but this is also a very important thing for us uh, to talk about the time that we're in. And, and I, I, for the students, when I mentioned this talk, I was really going to talk about music in crisis because I've given three of these talks. I've given one on the transformative power of music where we investigate everything from the the incredible cognitive development of the music, the role of music in cognitive development and applications in healthcare. I've given a lecture on music and concentration camps, and now I'm giving one in the middle of a pandemic. But I also want to talk about, um, per the prompt from your office, Jason, to talk about what brought me to Montana State and some of the mentors that I've, I've had in my life. And it seems to me that here, um, after 31 years at Montana State, um, I still feel like a, a young professor. I know my, I'm still Ilsa, but my gosh, I've been here a long time. And it's it's exciting to always feel that there's more to do and the important, the work that all of us done on this campus is absolutely important uh, for many, many reasons. But let me launch into my presentation and then I hope that there will be time for a conversation and some, for some questions. Um, I'm basically going to talk about what drives me. So here we are going to, I'm going to share my screen and I've practiced this. I never, uh, don't practice, that's part of being a cellist <laughs> and a musician as you practice. So here we go, my screen should go in just a second. There we go. And I have two share uh, sh screens here. And this second sh slide is especially for my colleague from the Southern Hemisphere, Craig Ogilvy. This is our perspective of the world. We look at the world in a slightly different way. And where that red arrow is, is where I'm from. I was born in South Africa and um, it's it's kind of worth just stopping for a moment and talk about w how did, what did South Africa, how did I land in South Africa and my family and the impact that this uh, wonderful country and the continent of Africa have, has had on me. So um, my Dutch ancestors arrived in the Cape of Good Hope in 1652. That's a long, long time ago. And my maiden name was Van Veik and um, I am Afrikaans. Um, Afrikaans uh, speaking family of uh, part of South Africa or Dutch a mixture of Dutch, French, Malaysian. Uh, none of us that speak Afrikaans can say that we're 100% Caucasian because that's not who we are. But um, I was raised speaking Afrikaans. Um, I was raised in the dirt. Uh, my family were humble beginnings. I'm the first person in my family to have a college degree. My mother was an incredible pianist, but had performance licentiates in performance in piano, taught at the university level. My dad was um, kind of an, uh, uh, an intern is the best way to describe him at the Johannesburg High Court, um, and then became a businessman, but he had no college education. Um, the other side of my family are Jewish, and I have found my Jew Jewish heritage through relentless research and inspired by my husband, Denny. My family's name was Chernin, and they were scientists and musicians. And I have one living uncle who actually came to Montana State and came to Bozeman three years ago and gave a lecture here. He's a parasitologist, and Michelle and Blake uh, Wiedenheft, Michelle Flanick and Blake Wiedenheft uh, met my uncle Jack. Um, but it was really meaningful to me to understand that that part of my family came to the Cape in the 1890s, uh, refugees of the Russian pogroms. pogroms. So my mother, uh, we did not have much as a family, um, but still we had a lot of privilege because we were a white family. And uh, my mother insisted that we learn to speak English and we would speak English really well. Um, sometimes I still stumble uh, in the English language, but it's not my first language. Um, and on the picture on the left is my mother with a wonderful beehive hairdo, and it's me playing my cello. And that's what we did in the evenings in South Africa. I actually know which piece I was playing, and I recognize the little book on the music stand. I still have that little book. It carried with me, uh, traveled with me all the way here. And then the picture on the right is the same thing, and that's um, my little daughter, our little daughter Elizabeth, on the screen with me, and just concentrating like crazy. Um, and this was at Billing, in Billings at a music camp. But for Elizabeth's uh, 
young life too. The evenings, uh, Denny would do the dishes and we would play music. And it was never my intent for her to become a musician, but I wanted her to be able to play chamber music and have a, a good um, solid grounding in music. And this is an interesting picture. Uh, the portrait in the back was a pastel of mine, the, uh, of me when I was 13 years old. And I traveled all the way to the United States with that pastel in my suitcase and had it rolled up in a, a, a folder in the closet. And Elizabeth, he played a concert that night. And I said to Denny, I have to go get something. And so I unrolled this pastel. You can see behind, that's Denny's legs. He's holding it up, that's his hands. And then I just had Elizabeth sit in front of it and took this picture with my cell phone. And I'm sure that you can see that the resemblance is, is quite something. So it made me happy. She had no idea my glasses were like that and my, I wore my hair like that too. So it's kind of fun. So what brought me to the United States? Um, in South Africa, my mother um, was an incredible force. So uh, gave us, my sister and I, instruments. Uh, I was the big tall one and I got the cello, my sister the violin, and she had a piano trio. Um, but we, we had much, not much, but we had music lessons. And so I started the piano when I was five, cello when I was eight. And then when I was tall, I was uh, 12, I was already quite tall and I loved playing my mom's uh, Hammond B3 organ. Um, and so my mother decided I should take organ lessons. And this organ teacher in Johannesburg didn't want to know anything about teaching a 12 year old, but long story short, I was already 5'12", little joke there, and started playing the organ. So I've all my life played three instruments, um, um, but the cello is where my heart is. In my senior year in South Africa, there was a, a music competition, and this is why promoting and helping students through major scholarship applications is part of what my what I should do and what I'm compelled to do is because of a conductor saying you should enter this competition, which I didn't think I had a shot at, um, changed my life. I entered the student Jim Joel music competition in 1983. It was um, a competition in Johannesburg, three nights of musicians competing one night after the other. I drew the lot to be on the Final performer on the third night on a Saturday night. Um, good. I, uh... Oops, a daisy. And uh, make a long story short, um, much to my surprise, I won this competition. This is the panel of the jury. Uh, there were conductors from the Netherlands, from the United States, from South Africa, and the head of South Africa Broadcasting Corporation. And in that moment, my whole life changed. I had a bursary to go and study for three years, either in England or in the United States. And I knew from that moment on, I really wanted to come to the United States because I, there was a certain cellist that I wanted to study with. And this is the letter to that certain cellist. And this is the conductor who wrote the letter. The, this is Brian Priestman, uh, a conductor in, of the Cape Town Orchestra, professor of music at Cape Town University. And he actually came to the United States and was professor of music director of orchestras at, at KU. But this is the letter of recommendation and introduction to Mitislav Rostropovich, who was the foremost cellist at that time. He's the only person that I wanted to study with. And I played the Dvorak with this conductor. And that was the letter of introduction. And then I was on my way. And this is the letter. This is for all the students here. This is the olden days before emails. This is the letter I had with me, which is my introduction. This is to Slava. This is Ilse Marie von Weyck. She doesn't know what she wants to do, but I hope that you can help her. So he did. And here we come to my mentors. This is the cellist that he said I should go and study with full time. Her name was Raya Garbazova. She was a female concert cellist, taught at Northern Illinois University, a university just outside Chicago, which is also a land grant institution. She only accepted five students per year. And an in international class, I was the only student, of course, from South Africa, but the only woman in this class. And um, we became quite close. It was she was a tough, tough teacher. And um, no matter how hard I practiced, the bar was always higher. But we um, we had an incredible relationship, almost like a mother and a daughter with the same types of tensions. But she did give me all her concert dresses, which I thought was a kind of a nice thing. The only trouble was that she was 5'4 and I'm 5'12. Again, my little joke in there. But I still have those dresses. Um, she is the cellist that Samuel Barber uh, composed his um, 
cello concerto for. And then this is Rostropovich. He would come to Chicago, to Northern Illinois, and give us master classes and would always check in. I learned a lot from him. I remember in one of my lessons, and this is for the students um, on this WebEx, and this is an important lesson, and I've never forgotten this lesson. Um, I practice my fingers through for a lesson with him. And um, and then uh, it, I started playing and he started ripping what I had done apart and in no uncertain terms. And it was really hard to take. And here I am very far from South Africa, very far from home. And uh, I kind of broke down a little bit. I just clenched and a tear started rolling down my face. And he looked at me and he said, um, what is wrong with you? Uh, when you know, when somebody tells you what you can do better, that is your happiest day. And, you know, for me, that young age took a little moment, but actually it is your happiest day. If somebody shows you how you could do something better, that is a happy day. So that is the letter from uh, the most important lesson from Slava. That is my picture of my mom, Barbara van Weyck, incredible pianist unbelievable music teacher um, a tough it was a tough road to be her daughter in many ways but um, you know what she she um, was an incredible force during apartheid years in South Africa can you imagine going to university and having to read books that were banned by the government well that's what happened and I could always count on my mother for having those banned books in her closet so I could always go read a Dry White Season by Andre Pierbrink and all these other wonderful banned books that the South African government didn't like us to read. But my mother was a force of nature. She taught us to think critically, to think independently. And I was thinking about this this morning for our students. It's important to know that she taught us to think critically within the context of South Africa, where that is apartheid is all you know. But she, by taking us to Israel and showing us different ways of viewing the world, um, really made us think independently. And it became very clear to me that if I stayed in South Africa, I would actually become a troublemaker and it would probably be better for me to go and study abroad. Um, one of my mentors in South Africa was a conductor named Walter, Walter Money. He was um, on the first stand violins of the London Symphony Orchestra and then also conducted the South African Youth Orchestra. And um, Boy, he believed in me when I didn't have a lot of confidence. I was 14 years old playing in the SABC Youth Orchestra, which was a very tough orchestra to get into. But to make a long story short, after one year of playing in the orchestra, the next year I arrived and you had to go to the librarian to get your music. And I went to pick up my music and the librarian gave me cello one. And I looked at it and I wouldn't believe it. And so I went back and I said, Mr. Grebner, there was a mistake. There's no way I can be cello one. But that's exactly what happened. I became the premier cello, principal cellist at age 14. And I could just feel the, the glare of the students behind me, which were all in college. But I had to learn very quickly. And it was a good experience. And with Moni, I played many, many concertos. In the United States, beside Gorbisova, my best mentor was uh, Gordon Epperson at the University of Arizona, another land grant institution. Um, I did not intend to complete my doctorate, but I went back to South Africa and I realized, oh, no, 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 I have to go back. This was the chance I, I have to take. And Dr. Epperson was not only a brilliant cellist and a pedagogue, but he was also a philosopher. His book, The Musical Symbol, is still the gold standard on the ethics and the philosophy of music. The why music book is Dr. Epperson's. Um, I was his last doctoral candidate, and I feel so fortunate that Dr. Epperson was in my life. Then I came to Montana State in 1989. So I won the Jim Joel in 83, and here I am six years later in Montana State. I was barely older than my students. That's a picture of Heidi um, uh, Hermanson. Her father uh, was a physics professor with Denny for many years. She was one of my first cello students, along with Jeff Safford's son. Jeff just passed away uh, this past winter. Um, Alex Safford. Those were my two cello students. And I started working and having fun with these students and eventually started the cello ensemble. And then eventually a studio, a studio of about 20 students at Montana State and then 25 students from all over the state that would drive on Saturdays to have lessons. I had a lot of fun. 
and um, probably the highlight was to go to China. We had special permission to have Montana State University Shiloh Ensemble on the Great Wall, and it played a concert there. It was freezing, and you can notice my little hat. Oh my gosh, my grandmother would have died if she saw that hat. It had a big communist star on the top. But anyway, it was a really wonderful experience for all of us to do that, to play in China. Then when I transitioned to the Honors College, um, I started doing great expeditions trips. And um, we would travel, we traveled. The first trip uh, I took was a group of students to Russia. And then we've gone to England and Ireland, of course, and then to South Africa. And that was really special to have a group of students. This is the Cape, the Good Hope. This is the southernmost tip of Southern Africa. You can see that rough sea. I can still look at that picture and I can feel the mist in my face. Um, but that has been very important to me. And then in the same year, I taught a seminar, um, which was a great experiment. It was called the Africa Seminar. And many, many MSU faculty participated in it, from Susan Colleen to, uh, to, to Scott, um, uh, Scott, I, I'm sp uh, forgetting his name now, on wildlife ecology. It was just a phenomenal thing to understand how many faculty at MSU are doing research in Africa, Africa as a whole. So it was a great experience. I hope we can do that again. Here are some select compositions that I've uh, composed over the time. Um, I really, I, I double majored in composition um, in Arizona and studied with Robert Muczynski, a wonderful American composer, but it started taking off when I came to Bozeman. I started composing like crazy. On a sabbatical, I wrote my cello concerto, Mandela, premiered it with the Billing Symphony in 2002. Um, really, the, I'm very proud of that work. Uh, the Yellowstone Suite I composed for our China trip and um, took images of Yellowstone National Park by Thomas Lee, the photographer, and then wrote a piece for cello ensemble and then eventually um, expanded to do it for the MSU Symphony on their tour too. And the idea was that Yellowstone becomes MSU, our identity where we are. I've composed a lot of chamber music. Gordon Karo is the Hungarian word actually for cello. And it was also for my teacher, Gordon Epperson, when he passed away, I wrote a cello duet, which Mike and Reynolds and I recorded and performed. Funkel and Koliander is a duo for clarinet, uh, excuse me, soprano sax and cello. Clafil is with Tani Barbara. Uh, this has been performed and recorded quite a bit. It's a piano lesson with my mother. And um, I took a simple South African tune and then wrote it in a whole variety of styles of composers. Simple Gifts is a piano quartet um, um, inspiring, inspired by Copeland. Lincoln Portrait, um, you know, the Lincoln Portrait is a piece by Irvin Copeland for massive orchestra and um, narrator. And um, the trouble was it was never performed in Montana. And so what I did, and it was a commission by the Mirror, I wrote it for piano quintet and narrator. And Professor Bob Rydell was the first narrator of the Lincoln Portrait. And we did it again with the opening of Aspenson Hall. Umzumkulu is a river in South Africa, and that's for cello orchestra. And then Unearth is a piece for cello and digital sound that I composed for Peter and Kathy Halstead and premiered at Tippett Rise. I've written quite a bit of vocal and choral works. Solidio Gloria is a piece for cello, uh, organ, and choirs. I set on Psalm 23, a Magnificat, that I did for St. James. Um, Sacagawea is an early piece that I wrote on um, the life of Sacagawea. It's a woman's life in words and music. And this is an interesting piece that I wrote for Elizabeth Croy in the music department um, because it actually takes the journals of Lewis and Clark and then juxtaposes Native American poetry. So we're looking at Sacagawea's life through these journals and understanding how difficult her life must have been. Composed quite a few film scores, and I really enjoyed uh, composing the film scores. Um, it's, it's, it's a passion of mine, and I sure learned a lot of music technology in the process. Um, but I have not done any film scores in recent years, just because um, at the moment my focus is the Honors College. And probably my lasting legacy will be that I composed the alma mater. This was a challenge from David Single. Um, I'm sure that many of our faculty know that for years and years and years, May or at Christmas time, our alma mater was, oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. And because a couple of us decided, no, 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 this can't be. And uh, we um, transitioned to uh, a piece that I wrote. Um, these are some of my film scores. This is Apology, um, written for um, Theo Lipford. 
um, for film on comfort women. This is all digital, and then it also has um, <clears throat> uh, live cello over it. And now I'm going to go, I'm just going to manually uh, move something over here. Otherwise, it might be a little bit too difficult. Um, can I just ask, is my, is my video? Yes. Am I frozen? Oops. Yeah, we don't have video anymore, but, but right before that, we saw kind of like a, a, a background screen. Okay. Okay, I think what is happening is that Webex is really giving us trouble. Shall I just continue, Jason? Yeah, that's fine. If, if you want to try to share again, go for it. Uh, but we did hear that lovely music, so uh, okay. even though we couldn't necessarily see uh, the video. Okay, good. Well, I'm going to jump ahead to the screen. Okay. Can you see the screen on is it a, 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 Jason? Can you see a screen? Oh no. I see. I see a screen with a lot of colors and uh, black and blue and a little bit of red. It's, right. yep. That's not good. Hold on. Yeah, I think it might be the other one. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to screen what I would share my screen right in front of me. I think this would be better. Don't you think, Jason? We, we we can see that. Yeah, if you want to expand that a little bit larger, that'd be that'd be great. But yeah, we can see that PowerPoint now. Okay, how about that? Is yeah. that good? I okay. Think work. Yeah, I had WebEx meetings uh, this afternoon, and I had this difficulty getting on and off and all of that. So um, I I also have some cello music to play. So I'm just going to jump to. So what do I care about? Um, and especially during this time, because I music is is without a doubt, it's my discipline, it's what I'm passionate about. And um, I really feel that everyone should have access to music. And I'm not a, a musical snob. I, I have, <laughs> from teaching America's uh, popular music, I have, literally have from A to Z. Um, I believe in music education for all. I was very happy to move to Montana in 1983 to learn that um, all the public schools had music. They had band, choir, mm -hmm. orchestra in many places as well. That was very important to me. And we know that if a student has music lessons or access to music, especially between ages five and six, we know that their IQ can be improved. We know that students prefer do better and standardized mm -hmm. test scores through music. So music education is really, really important. But it's also because we need to be able to express ourselves through the arts. I believe music should be for all. And I am very excited to hear about during the pandemic how symphony orchestras have reached out to audiences, trying to build new audiences, particularly during the pandemic. One of my favorite things that I like to do is to take students to Tippet Rise. As you know, Tippet Rise is this wonderful art center by Red Lodge, Montana incredible artists come and perform here every summer that didn't happen last summer and it's not going to happen this summer either but what i wanted to say is i take these 20 students and many many of them have never ever heard a classical music concert before in their lives and then i get super excited because i know what they're going to hear will just blow their minds and that never fails but what is the key to this is that before we go to Tippet Rise, before we actually enter the art center grounds, we go to a little park and we have a picnic and we have wonderful sandwiches. And then I give the students a lecture on the music that they're going to hear so that they're totally, totally prepared to completely understand 
what it means to hear the Goldberg Variations for the first time. Why did Bach write this piece of music? What does it mean to hear all the Chopin preludes in a row? What does it mean to hear certain pieces of music by Liszt? So it just, it, it, it just sets the stage. And then the student's level of enjoyment and appreciation just skyrockets. So that's what I mean with music for all. And I think that sometimes, you know, audiences um, need the preparation, no matter how many times we've gone to symphony concerts, and particularly for new music. Have the composer there, have an artist there, just, just to explain and prepare to the, the audience. Tell them, okay, you're going to hear Rachmaninoff's second symphony, or you're going to hear Mahler's second. Let me tell you what happens in this music. I really care about suicide rates and despondency, and a with a group of MSU uh, researchers on a MacArthur 100 million and change grant for Project Montana. Uh, maybe a little bit later I'll bring this up, but I don't want to test the technology too far. And then, um, oops, a daisy, what happened here? There we go. I also definitely care deeply about honors education, and I hope that afterwards we might be able to see each other and we can talk about why the honors college is so important as a land grant institution. Basically, in a nutshell, when our honors program was started way back in 1965 and then reinstated in 1981, yes, there was a period that it was cut. That's a whole different story. Um, but basically about a book that the honors program was reading during budget cut years. Um, but I don't want to go to that right now. I just want to say that honors education is really important at a land grant institution because so we serve all our students. And when the program was first started, what happened is that the state legislature noticed that the Montana's best students were all leaving the state. And so the honors college here and in Missoula were founded to keep such high achieving students and also from the region in state and provide students whose parents could not make up the gap between an Ivy League institution of scholarship uh, uh, education, even on scholarship. It's a really important um, thing that I feel very passionate about. I have to have a little joke here. This is the impact on COVID on 19 on music. It's been a very rough go for our orchestras, even the Metropolitan Orchestra uh, furloughed all the musicians last year and now are negotiating a 30% pay cut for those musicians. So um, it has hit music incredibly hard. Um, I'd like to go to this page, um, but I would love to be able to have video, otherwise it's not really going to make sense. Um, this is in Anna Magdalena's um, Bach's manuscript. This is the manuscript in Berlin of the uh, six suites for solo cello. And this is the particular suite. I find myself always going to the second suite in D minor to play that. Um, I'd love to be able to have this up while I play, but let me just see if I can get my video to work. That might be difficult. Let me just go back to stop sharing. I don't have, even have the option to share my video. Um, and I, I see a lot of, I wonder is there any way that we can reload this? My, what do you think? You got, um, what's, what do you, what do you suggest here on that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. So can, if you, you mean your video, right? So you might have to unshare. Um, I've, I've stopped sharing, but I don't even have a, a button that will allow my video to start again. Oh, you don't have a share screen? Even I, I, have a share, I have a share screen, but I don't have the video button to uh, make my video live again. Oh, boy. It's really weird. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been having a bunch of WebEx issues myself. Like I said, I had to log on to this through the web um, version and then finally got the other one to kick on. Um, do you want to send it to us and, and have my try to load it, uh, Ilsa Marie, or, or do you want to proceed differently? Would you um, like to just, actually, would you like to just log off and try to log back on and see if that resolves it? I will be happy to do that. Let me All do right, that. Let's, we'll wait for you. Let's see if we can get this <laughs> resolved by that. Sometimes the Thank reboot you. is the way to go. I will try. Thank you. Okay.
And Jason, if there's bandwidth problems, if everybody else shuts off their video, that might help. Yeah, yeah. I see most people actually do. Um, so let's go ahead and do that once she gets back on. Well, while we're waiting, um, I'll go ahead and just put in an early, uh, I usually do this at the end, is just to introduce you as to our next 994 calling. So while we're waiting for Ilsa Marie to come back. Uh, oh, there she is. Okay. Hi, Ilsa, you're you're muted at this point, but let's go ahead and give it a try again and see. Do, do you have those buttons back now? Um, you know, what I did is I changed computers, actually. <laughs> okay. I changed computers because what has happened is that my, um, I think my pro my computer is overloaded with all the music things that I have loaded up. Uh, I okay. kind of think that's what has happened. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is I'm going to Cisco Webex and I've put it on music mode right now. And I'm going to play my cello. Shall we do an experiment? Let's give it a try. Okay. I like it. And uh, there we go. I'm lowering the screen. And then we can maybe just do some questions and answers about some of the things that I touched on. That would be great, Ilsa. Okay. Can you hear a funny sound? There we go. I stopped it. Oops. Uh, okay. So this is my beautiful cello, George. Zoom has slightly better sound than WebEx, but WebEx now has a music mode too. This is the prelude to the second suite by Johann Sebastian Bach, composed around 1721, which means it's exactly 400 years old. And it's still as timely today as it was then. <laughs> stop there because I have no idea what it sounds like on the other we, side. We can hear it. It <laughs> sounds beautiful. So that is, um, Johann Sebastian Bach wrote this in 1721. Then the music went away. Nobody knew it existed. And it wasn't until 1890 that Pablo Casals found the music in Barcelona. It was the Grutzmacher edition and it looked like cello exercises. 
And then he started practicing it for 10 years before he played it in public. The six suites for solo cello by Johann Sebastian Bach. Every suite has a totally different character. Most people know the first one. I played the second one. Very different character. The third one, my cello teacher always said, if you play this one, you have to say, I am the king. So Kobe isn't too bad if you're a solo cellist. <laughs> and then in that third one is uh, two dances that uh, people know very well. Um, that's the other thing. My mother always believed very firmly that we should commit things to memory. So we memorized music. I thought I should play you just a little bit of the piece that Yo-Yo Ma played on the one year of the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. the fifth suite and then the D major is church bells on a Sunday morning they are all they're just incredible pieces of music so that's why Craig Ogilvy where I never mind playing solo Bach when our masters and doctoral students are being uh, hooded um, I have enough music to go on for quite a while <laughs> So, well, I think I'd like to stop there and maybe answer some questions.